So, uh, Elijah, I, probably I, if you've been in church, for, you grew up in church, or you've been in church for so long of the time, you've heard his name. He's not one of the canical, uh, how do you say that word, can, 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 canical? Did I say it right? Canical? Um, he's not part of the prophecy canon of Scripture. In other words, there's not a book of the Bible named after him. Okay, but he is the preeminent. He is uh, the preeminent and uh, one of the most powerful prophets uh, that uh, that is uh, talked about in Scripture. So, uh, in the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah suddenly appears on the scene. We'll see this in just a minute. He suddenly appears on the scene, uh, and in Israel during the reign, uh, early in the reign of wicked and corrupt King Ahab and his wife. Jezebel. Okay, you know that. So God called Elijah at a critical time in Israel's history. I want, I'm setting this up, so listen carefully. God called Elijah at a critical time in Israel's history when the idolatrous worship of Baal threatened to eradicate the worship of the Lord. That was, that was Jezebel's desire to eradicate worship of Jehovah and replace it with the worship of Baal. Elijah's humble obedience to God led to a life filled with some pretty miraculous and incredible stories of faith. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at not just the high points of Elijah's life, but some of the low points too. Because this is, I love the description in the book of James. Elijah was a man just like us. Okay, I want you to personalize that, okay? And I want you to say it just like me, okay? Will you say it with me? Elijah was a man just like me. That means that he had high points and he had low points and a lot of stuff in between. How many of you live there and understand that, right? Okay? So listen, we get, a, we get a sense of Elijah's importance, not just because he's a huge figure in the Old Testament, but he also has a place in the New Testament as well. Uh, let me just give you this. Uh, one of, one of uh, the commentaries that I, that I use as I study and prepare, this is what it shares about Elijah in the New Testament. As the forerunner to Christ, John the Baptist was, came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. That's how he's described. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's in Luke 1.17. And some of the people thought that he was the promised Elijah. You can see that in at least three of the Gospels, uh, as well as in the Old Testament book of Malachi. Elijah was with Moses uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus went up on the mountain with, with his, uh, a couple of disciples, and, uh, and, and Moses and Elijah appeared, and Jesus has a conversation with them there on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And some Bible students believe that it's Moses and Elijah that, that are the two witnesses mentioned in Revelation chapter 11. One author described Elijah this way, Elijah was to the prophets what Moses was to the law. Here's what I want you to know. Elijah was a man of humble obedience and conviction. He lived and he ministered in a period of great corruption and idolatry. His example, and this is, this is, the, this is the, the, uh, the heart of why we're, we're, we're talking about this, so listen. His example of a courageous life lived under relentless pressure can help us to live as we walk in an evil age, as we walk humbly with God and stand strong against evil. So listen, I'm, I, I want, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into the first point in this message, which is this, God calls special people at difficult times. God calls special people at difficult times. Now, now listen, here's what I don't want you to think. I don't want you to think that Elijah is an outlier, okay? In other words, that he's unique or that he's a singular, that, that yes, he is unique and singular in, in, in the sense of his person, but not in the sense of what he did. Not because, and the reason I'm saying this is because of what I mentioned in James chapter 5, which is he's a man just like us. So, so listen, as this, is the, this is the danger of telling Elijah's story and kind of following Elijah's story in Scripture is we start to think, well, he's exceptional. I, that's not me. I'm not. I, there's no way that I could live like that. 
So, so here's what you need to do, okay? You need to, we're, we're not going to, we're, we're, we're going to kind of, if you will, we're going to kind of pull Elijah off of your pedestal. Because that's where most people have elevated him. We're going to pull him off the pedestal, and, we're gonna, and you're going to see that he's just, he's about as ordinary as can be. What made him exceptional was he said yes to God. He said yes. To, that's what makes him exceptional. Okay, I I get it. You know, because because on that we were we were joking about the uh, the little bumper video there that uh, that shows uh, you know the the prophet standing in front of the fire and the fire coming down from heaven. That's like the highlight. You guys know that you know, and uh, that's the highlight of Elijah's story. You know, when he goes up on Mount Carmel, faces down the hundreds uh, over three hundred prophets, almost over four hundred prophets of Baal, and and you know and 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 he wins. You know, that's the highlight. The problem with that, okay, is that's that that really is toward the middle end of his story. It's not, it's not at the beginning. So you need to know the beginning so that you can understand how, how he ends up there. God calls special people in difficult times. All right, so let's talk about those difficult times. Let's talk about the setting that Elijah come, steps onto. In the Old Testament, King Jeroboam all right, I'm, I'm going back, okay? Uh, we're not going to start with Ahab and Jezebel. We need to go back a little bit further, all right? In the Old Testament, King Jeroboam sets the bar for wickedness. He's the man who led the rebellion against King Solomon's son, Rehoboam. There will not be a test on all these names, so don't worry, okay? Just stick with me. I know you hear Jeroboam, Rehoboam. I, I, I'm, already, you're, I'm already messed up, okay? Just listen, okay? Jeroboam leads a rebellion against King Solomon's son. And in that rebellion, he tragically divides the kingdom of Israel into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom that Jeroboam becomes the king over, called Israel or Samaria, and then the southern kingdom, which has the line of David, David's descendants, called Judah. Okay, so the northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom. Here's what you need to know. Elijah shows up in the northern kingdom, but not during King, uh, King Jeroboam's reign because a lot of things happen. And I want to set this up for you about what happens because, because from that ill-fated beginning of the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom had 19 different rulers Every single one of them was wicked. And this is how the Bible describes them. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The southern kingdom, okay, and, and eventually I should mention, Israel uh, uh, fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C., 722 years before Christ. Uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, falls to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom, Judah, had 17 different kings in its 300-year history. Eight, eight of those monarchs followed the Lord their God. That's how they're described. They followed the Lord their God. But nine of those kings over Judah were wicked men who followed the practices of the kings of Israel. So the southern kingdom ended with the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., and by the Babylonians, and that's what led to their 70-year captivity in Babylon. During this period, okay, this, this period of wickedness and apostasy, God called prophets to confront the king and the people. And he called them, to, and, and the prophets would call them to repentance. And, and let me tell you, answering God's call as a prophet was not a cushy assignment, Speaking for God and confronting the wickedness and idolatry of the rulers and, and the people was not popular, and it often involved great danger and risk. So, back to Jeroboam, back to the beginning of the northern kingdom of Israel. Jeroboam was the first king of that northern kingdom. 
And I want you to hear this description of his life. And if you've got your Bibles, you can follow along with me because we're going to march our way all the way to, to chapter 17, but we'll start here at chapter 13. Here's what it says. But even after this, Jeroboam did not return, did not turn from his evil ways. He continued to choose priests from the common people. He appointed anyone who wanted to become a priest for the pagan shrines. This became a great sin and resulted in the utter destruction of Jeroboam's dynasty from the face of the earth. That's what it says in 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 33 and 34. But, it, but listen, what it says, it says, after this, well, after what? God sent a young prophet from Judah, okay, the southern kingdom, into the northern kingdom to confront Jerob- Jeroboam, to confront the king. And as he confronts the king, okay, as he, as he came into, and, and met Jeroboam and the people gathered there, he was about to offer an idolatrous sacrifice, a, a worship at, at, at an altar before an, the idol that he had built, which by the way was, uh, there were two, he, he doubled down on, on Aaron's uh, sin uh, when, when Moses was up on the mountain, you know, Aaron made the golden calf and Israel worshiped the golden calf. Jeroboam doubles down on it and he made two golden calves. He's worshiping. He's ready to offer a sacrifice to the golden calf. The young, the young prophet from the southern kingdom comes in and he, and he denounces Jeroboam's idolatrous worship at the altar. And Jeroboam intended to kill the young prophet and he point, as he points at him, the Bible says the king's hand became paralyzed in that position and he couldn't pull it back. Then the altar was split in two. And the ashes poured out just as the young prophet had announced. Jeroboam pleaded with the young prophet to pray and to ask God to restore his hand. And this is what we know in in 1 Kings chapter 13 verse 6. God did. God healed the king. And his hand was restored. But even after that... Even that, after that miracle, even after that display of God's grace, Jeroboam continued in his wickedness. Now, let's kind of follow this, this wicked succession that, that, that happens after that. In, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 20, and chapter 15, verses 25 and 26, this is what it says. Jeroboam reigned in Israel for 22 years. When Jeroboam died, his son Nadab became the king. Nadab, son of Jeroboam, this is in chapter 15, verse 25, Nadab, son of Jeroboam, began to rule over Israel in the second year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned in Israel two years. But listen to this. Listen to verse 26. But he did, he did what was evil in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his father continuing the sins that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. Nadab reigned for only two years before he was assassinated. Go to 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 27 and 28. It says, Then Basha, son of Ahijah from the tribe of Issachar, plotted against Nahab and assassinated him while he and the Israelite army were laying siege to the Philistine town of Gibbethon. Basha killed Nadab in the third year of King Asa's reign in Judah, and he, Basha, became the king of Israel. Surely, Basha was a better monarch. Look at verse 19, or uh, uh, verse 29, rather. He immediately, Basha immediately slaughtered all the descendants of King Jeroboam so that not one of the royal family was left, just as the Lord had promised concerning Jeroboam by the prophet Abijah or Ahijah from Shiloh. This was done because Jeroboam had provoked the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, by the sins that he had committed and the sins that he caught caused Israel to commit, okay? So Basha is not the kind of guy that you want your daughter bringing home. So what does it say about him? Chapter 16, verse 7. The message from the Lord against Basha and his family came through the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani. It was delivered because, listen, Basha had done what was evil in the Lord's sight, 
just as the family of Jeroboam had done. And also because Baasha had destroyed the family of Jeroboam. The Lord's anger was provoked by Baasha's sins. So Elah, son of Baasha, began to rule over Israel in the 26th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned in the city of Terzah for two years. So Elah, Baasha's son, reigned only two, only two years? Look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 9. Then Zimri, who commanded half of the royal chariots, made plans to kill him. One day, one day in Terza, Elah, the king, was getting drunk at the home of Arza, the supervisor of the palace. Zimri, okay, he's, he's one of the commanders, commander of half of the chariot forces of, of Israel. Zimri walks in and stru- struck him down and killed him. This happened in the 27th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. Then Zimri became the next king. Stop here for just a second. You, you might notice that they're mentioning, uh, they're comparing um, the reign of these kings, the short-lived reign of these kings, to King Asa. Did you catch that? Okay. So in a 26 period, 26-year period of one king in Judah, King Asa, there's been at least four kings in Israel. Zimri immediately killed, okay, picking this back up at first, uh, first Kings chapter 16, verse 11, Zimri immediately killed the entire royal family of Basha, leaving him not even a single male child. He even destroyed distant relatives and friends. Zimri, so Zimri destroyed the dynasty of Basha as the Lord had promised through the prophet Jehu. Now listen to this. This happened because of of all the sins that Baasha and his son Elah had committed, and because of the sins they led Israel to commit, they provoked the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, with their worthless idols. All right, so, so not only do they come under God's judgment because of their sins, but they come under God's judgment because as leaders, they led other, they led the whole nation to sin. And this is This is, remember, this is over and over and over again through the history of the northern kingdom of Israel. Murder, assassination, 48 years of godless and wicked men scheming and flaunting evil in the sight of the Lord. That's bad. Could it it get any worse? Well, I'm I'm glad you asked because, yes, it does. Chapter 16, verse 21. Pick it up there. But now the people of Israel were split into two factions. Half of the people tried to make Tibni, son of, son of Ganath, their king, while the other half supported Omri. But Omri's supporters defeated the supporters of Tim, Tibni, so Tibni was killed and Omri became the next king. Omri began to rule over Israel in the 31st year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned 12 years in all, six of them in Terzah. Then Omri brought the, bought the hill, now known as Samaria, from its owner Shimmer for 150 pounds of silver, and he built a city on it, and he called the city Samaria, it becomes the capital of the northern kingdom. Samaria in honor of Shimmer. Look at verse 25. But Omri did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. Okay, so if Jeroboam sets the bar for wickedness, Omri has just exceeded it. Because he did even more than the kings before him. Verse 26, he followed the example of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and all the sins he had committed and that he had led Israel to commit. The people provoked the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, with their worthless idols. So that when Omri died, he was buried in Samaria. Then his son Ahab became the next kin, the next king. We just charted over 60 years of evil that began with Jeroboam and, and, and corrupted the people of Israel all the way downward into the reign of Ahab. So this is how it begins. Verse 29, King Ahab, 
son of Omri, began to rule over Israel in the 38th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 22 years. Uh, ironically, the same amount of time that Jeroboam led Israel. But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. And as though that were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians, and he began to bow down in worship of Baal. So, I, stopping right here, what should stand out to us here? Other than Ahab's record-breaking evil and corruption, something else. There is no record of any of the wives of the previous kings of Israel. Not one. So why is this information significant? Because Jezebel is not only the power behind the throne, Jezebel will rule the people of Israel. Another reason? Jezebel led Israel from the worship of the two golden calves of Jeroboam that Jeroboam had introduced in his reign, at the beginning of his reign, She led them to worshiping the Canaanite idol, Baal. Baal was the Sidonian god of of rain and and fertility. So they worshiped Baal because he, this supposedly, he controlled the seasons, the crops, and the land itself. The Canaanites worshiped Baal as the sun god and as the storm god. He's often depicted as, as holding a lightning, uh, a, a, a bolt of lightning in his hand. And he defeated enemies and produced crops. They also worshiped him as a fertility god. And, and they offered their children in sacrifice to Baal. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and it involved ritualistic prostitution At times, appeasing Baal required human sacrifice, usually a baby, a child. Usually the firstborn of the one who was making the sacrifice. The priest of Baal appealed to their God in rites that you'll see on Mount Carmel in that showdown that Elijah has with them. Their their worship was in wild abandon. They loud, ecstatic cries, but also self-inflicted injury. They would cut themselves and make themselves bleed in worship. In spiritual terms, this was a time of complete and absolute darkness. The distance between God and His people could not have been further. Look at verse 32, 1 Kings chapter 16. King, first Ahab, first Ahab built a temple and, on an, and, and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an Asherah pole. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. Ahab sets a whole new bar, bar for wickedness. Asherah was the chief female goddess worshipped as the consort of Baal. The worship was sexual in nature, again, often involving ritual prostitution. The poles or the pillars that that were sculpted in the shape of Asherah were called Asherim, okay? And they were associated with Baal worship. This is a dark and depressing history. And I don't know about you, but as I read through this repeated wickedness, over and over and over again, I I find myself just shaking my head and wondering when God is going to lower the boom. When God is going to lower the boom in judgment. Enter Elijah. That's the setting that Elijah walks into. Elijah is the one that's called into that moment. The lowest moment, the most wicked moment in Israel's history as Ahab and Jezebel rule over Israel. Check out chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, 
told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. That's it. <laughs> Did you catch this? No introduction, no fanfare. All of a sudden, Elijah's on the scene. He just shows up. What, what do we know about him? I, I, what, here's what we need to know about him. His name. Elijah means, the Lord is my God. Or, my God is Jehovah. So, so just think about this. Think about the stark contrast between Ahab and Jezebel who rule the land of Israel and they're promoting the idolatrous worship of Baal. When Elijah arrives, his very name declares war. It's as if, you know, they're saying, we're promoting Baal. We're pr- promoting I- this idolatrous worship of Baal. This, he, he is our God. Then they're encouraging all the people to worship Baal. Elijah walks in, in and, and he looks at, Eli- at King Ahab, and he says, my name's Elijah. In other words, you may be a follower of Baal, but I'm a servant of Jehovah. I have one God. Literally, his name means, uh, Elijah's name, the E-L, is is in reference to Elohim. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Elohim, the king of kings, higher than any earthly monarch or false god of the nations. He is, and he is, this is the second part of Elijah's name, Jehovah, the covenant-making God who is faithful to keep His promises. He is the one, Elijah, in in essence, he says, He is the one I serve, before whom whom I stand. In other words, I'm not standing in front of a lowly king, Ahab. I'm standing before God. Look, while the distance between God and Israel has reached its widest point, Elijah is there standing in the gap. What about his home? I, because this is, this is kind of somewhat of a mystery uh, archaeologically because he's, he's from uh, Tishba. Where, where's Tishba? Well, we know in Scripture that it was in Gilead, and that's on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Archaeologists uh, uh, tell us that Gilead was a backwater place. It was a remote country without any sophistication. Uh, it, it was kind of a dry desert place. That's it. That's all we know of Elijah's hometown. He was from a small, obscure village in a rough and rugged country. That's all we know. What about his style? What about Elijah's style? When Elijah is first introduced here in Scripture, his first recorded actions are to confront a king. What do you think his style is? In your face. Elijah didn't mince words. Elijah didn't approach the king with any fanfare. Elijah didn't come in and say, oh, king. There was no deference. There was no, there was no bowing before this king. Elijah walks in and says, hey, I serve the, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. I serve Elohim, Elohim Jehovah. The one that you have abandoned, the one that you deny. In and then he goes on to make his the judgment regarding the rain. From the get-go, Elijah is in Ahab's face, which might explain just a little bit further on. I think it's around 17, verse 17 of this chapter, where he where he where Ahab calls Elijah the troubler of Israel. Isn't that just a terrible thing to be called? Look, there's, there is no apparent fear or reluctance on Elijah's part in this moment. It's with, it's, it's with boldness that he stands before the king. He's not polished. He's, not, he's from a backwater town. He's, he's not, he's, he probably didn't dress the part, uh, whatever the part needed to be to stand in the king's presence. He stands before the wicked king and he pronounces God's judgment, Period. Elijah answered God's call with simple obedience, and he is a man on fire. He is a man on mission. Let me just stop right here. 
One of the things that, that, that as a pastor that I see in, in happening with a lot of men in particular is they are not on mission. And if you are a man and you don't have a mission, you are going to flounder. You are built, you are made for mission. Okay? See, the problem is sometimes we think our mission is our career. Here's what you may not know. Careers end. Economies change. What are you, what's your mission once your job's over? You've got to have a mission. If you don't have a mission, you're going to flounder. If you don't have a mission, I, and, and somebody, you know, I, I was talking to somebody, and, and, I'm, and we were talking about this very thing, and they're like, well, I guess I need to be a, like a greeter at Walmart now that I'm retired. I'm like, man, you're, you're called to a higher mission than that. I mean, great if you want the job, if you, need to, if you want to greet people. It's not, it, it's not that that's, that's beneath us. The point is that God, God wants you on His mission. So Elijah's in direct opposition to Ahab and Jezebel's wicked promotion of Baal, the worship of this false god. And, the, and, and you might have caught this, the prophet declares himself as a servant of the Lord, the God of Israel. He knows who he is. And that's, what, that's where his confidence lies. See, men that don't have mission and men that don't know who they are are in trouble. They're susceptible to a lie. They're susceptible to a false cultural image. God, I'm not getting any amens here. Is that because you're convicted? Listen, I believe our generation, this generation, this moment in history, God is calling Elijah's. The old song that we used to sing years ago, these are the days of Elijah, that hasn't changed. Has the world gotten better since we sang that song with abandon 20 years ago? Has it gotten better? Had, is, is the world somehow and more more uh, oriented toward God? Is the world, I mean, I mean it, does it look that way to you at all? Come on, you got to have your, your head stuck in the sand to believe that the world has gotten better in the last 20 years. So listen, if we were singing these are the days of Elijah with abandon 20 years ago, I'm telling you even more so, these are the days of Elijah. These are the days that God is calling men and women to take a stand to stand strong in the face of evil. Elijah has something to teach us. I like how he, he effectively sets the record straight when he says, I'm here, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm here as the representative of the King of Kings, the powerful God whose greatness and whose glory surpasses every earthly monarch, who surpasses your majesty, Ahab, and who will absolutely is greater than your false god. Ahab, you may worship Baal as the god of rain and storm, but I'm here to tell you that the god over the rain and storm is going to withhold water. There will be no rain and there will be no dew until I say so. Elijah is pronouncing a nation spanning famine. No rain, no crops, cattle will die, people will die. In this difficult hour of Israel's history, God didn't find this man in the, in the palace or in the court of the king. What's interesting is he, he didn't even find Elijah among the prophets who lived in the land. God looked for someone with the backbone to stand alone. Someone who had the courage to say, that's wrong. Someone who would stand toe-to-toe 
with an idolater and proclaim, God is God. Elijah shows us that answering God's call is going to require integrity. Okay, this is what makes him special. Not just his simple obedience, that's huge, okay, but also the fact that he has integrity. Elijah doesn't compromise his principles, and we shouldn't compromise our principles to stay in business or to secure a good grade or to make the team. We shouldn't compromise our principles to to remain popular or to earn a promotion. I like the way one author said it, those who find comfort in the court of Ahab can never bring themselves to stand in the gap with Elijah. We're not supposed to live in the court of the wicked. If you're comfortable with your culture, if you're comfortable with your culture, you can't stand in the gap. Here's the second thing we know. Not only does God call special people and difficult times, His methods are unorthodox. His methods don't make sense. Why only one man? Why not an army? Why doesn't God send an army to just wipe Ahab and Jezebel and all these wicked rules? Why doesn't He do that? Why does He send one man? And why is it someone who's unknown, seemingly insignificant, from an obscure town that no, is no one's des- vacation destination? Why call Elijah? Listen, consider these names. Elijah, David, Esther, Moses, and Joseph. Even casually knowing their stories, we, could, we would never describe them as mediocre. And that's just from the Old Testament. These were men and women who were willing to stand alone against the rulers and the powers of be of their day. They were not reluctant in response to God's call. They, they were never embarrassed to represent God and to proclaim the name of the Lord. This is what the this is this reminds me of what God spoke through another prophet in the Old Testament, Ezekiel. Chapter 22, verse 30, this is what he says. I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so that I wouldn't have to destroy the land. But I found no one. Is God still searching for people who will make a difference? Of course. Of course he is. Will he find them here at Calvary? That's the question, isn't it? If God's still looking for, for special people in difficult days, and, and, and we know that that's true of our day, and we know that He's still searching, it doesn't make sense. I, I, I get it. I get it. But listen, you need to know that Jesus, Jesus taught that His followers would stand out, didn't He? This is what He taught. There's no way around this. You're supposed to live different. You're supposed to look different. You're supposed to sound different. Less like the world and more like Jesus. That's what, the whole, that's what spiritual formation is all about. God taking us from who we are to who He wants us to be. Less of like me and more like Jesus. And if you know me, then you know i got a ways to go. And I know you. I, I, yeah, thank you, Bobby. Uh, And I know you, and I know some of you got a ways to go too, okay? The beauty is that we get to do do this journey together. Here's what Jesus said to his followers. Matthew chapter 5. I've I've read this before, but in this context, it's so important. He said, you're the salt of the earth. What good is salt if it loses its flavor? In other words, what good is salt if it's like everything else? You're supposed to stand out. Okay? I don't know that we, we talked about salt's a preservative and salt, a, but you know what? Salt is different. You know when salt is in something. Okay? If salt tastes like, just like everything else, then, then it's not salt. He says, you're the salt of the earth. You're supposed to stand out. 
Can you make it salty again, Jesus asked. It'll be thrown out and it'll tra- trample underfoot as worthless. He, then he goes on to say, you're the light of the world. He says, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. That's silly. Instead, a lamp, I, Jesus didn't say that, I said that, okay? Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house, to everyone in the vicinity. Look, you're supposed to be a, you're supposed to be salt that brings flavor. You're suppo- your life is supposed to be different than the rest of the world. You're supposed to be light in the midst of darkness. That's what he's calling you to. You don't hide that light. And in fact, the light is intended. God intends for you to bring light to everyone that's in your vicinity. That's everyone, not just in your home, but everyone in the vicinity of your life. He says, in the same way, let your good deeds, that's what, that's what often sets us apart, our good, the fact that we do good things, the fact that we are kind, the fact that we show grace, that's what stands out. So he says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father, not praise you. Not commend you, but so that you point them to him. According to this calling, we aren't supposed to blend into the scenery. We're not supposed to look like the world. Because after all, how can light blend with darkness? But it takes courage when darkness rules the land. In this age of tolerance and compromise... It will almost certainly require us to stand alone for God at times. Maybe you've talked yourself out of God's call. I'm I'm not special. I'm not gifted. I'm not talented. In other words, I'm not like them. Surely there's someone more qualified than me. This is usually where we play the comparison game. We look at others who are more gifted, more talented, and like Moses at the burning bush, standing in God's presence with his shoes off, we roll out the excuses and inform God that he's got the wrong person. Check it out. You can check out his story in, in Exodus. Don't miss the ministry opportunity that is right where you are. It may be right in front of you. It may be in your home or in your neighborhood or at work. God's methods are unorthodox. And from our perspective, sometimes they're illogical. Think about it. God chose the youngest of Jesse's sons to be the king of Israel. David's brothers mocked him before he walked down into the valley to face down Goliath and rout the Philistine army. You don't have to do a deep dive in Scripture to know that God chooses some of the most unlikely candidates. Okay, his methods are unorthodox. He chooses some of the most unlikely candidates and he gives them some of the most illogical marching orders to victory. Joshua, march around the city. Come on, you don't have to know a lot of scripture to know that this is how God works. It doesn't always make sense to us. God, why would you choose me? God, why would you call me? Surely there's someone, why not, why not call them? Why don't you, and God, God says, I, I want you. I'm calling you. You're the man, you're the woman on, that I want on mission. Here's the third thing we know about Elijah's story. We stay, we, because not only, does God, not only does God call special people in difficult times, and not only does, are his ways unorthodox, but we stand with God. Now, now um, Elijah used the phrase before God, but this is the same, it's the exact same, okay, The idea of standing with God. When we answer God's call, we don't just stand in the gap. We stand before God. 
When we answer, when God says, I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap, I'm looking for someone to, to, to stand in the gap for, the, for, for their family, to stand in the gap for their friends, to stand in the gap for their country. I'm looking for someone. I, at Calvary, I'm calling someone to stand in the gap. When you say yes, when you say, okay, okay, God, I'm, here I am, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm willing I don't feel I'm qualified, but I, I'm, I, I'm willing. Oh, that, that's all he needs. All he needs is willingness. God's still looking for men and women who are all in. This describes those whose hearts are completely his. God is looking for those who don't blend in with the scenery and who have not compromised with the prevailing culture. And friends, we never really stand alone. God is standing with us because His Spirit is living. Come on, His Spirit lives in us. And if His Spirit is living in us, then His Spirit is empowering us to do what He's called us to do. Remember Jesus' promise to his followers, another promise? He taught it this way. He said, it's best for you if I go away. Wait a minute. Stop right there. I don't think it's good for Jesus not to be here. I'd rather have Jesus right here, physically. I'd rather have Jesus with me all the time. Jesus told his disciples, no, I need to go because if I don't go, then the Father can't send the Spirit who you know and who, who will be living in you. That's the promise. Check it out, John 14 and John 16. That's where you can read this stuff. He said, it's best for you if I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate, the paraclete, won't come. And, but if I do a go, go away, then I will send him to you. One of the last conversations that Jesus had with his followers You can read it in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power if you, he says, as you wait on the Lord, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, Jesus said, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You don't stand alone. God's Spirit lives in you, which is why The Bible tells us, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. There's something important here that I don't want you to miss. Because we live in the age of outrage. I'm on social media, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't always post a lot. If I post anything, usually it might be something about my family, or I'm tagged in something about my family, or I post something from the church, but I just, I don't, and part of the reason is, is because um, it's exhausting. Social media is exhausting, okay? Um, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, Facebook, it's all exhausting. X, because everyone is outraged. And right now, there's a lot of Christians outraged uh, about the Olympics. And, and, and I get it. Some of you aren't watching. And some of you have posted this stuff. And that, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to condemn that, okay? Just, just hear me out, though, okay? In an age of outrage, when we spend an inordinate amount of time and energy pointing out all the worldly things that the world does, are you surprised that the world would be worldly? Are you surprised that heathens act like heathens? Act like heathens. One of my dad's favorite words to describe his two sons, by the way. I don't know what he meant by that, but it, as a pastor, I do now. I, 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 Look, the, the world, this, the world is going to act like the world. The world's going to do stupid things. The world is not going to affirm your faith. So why get offended when it does? Why do we lose our minds over, over the fact that, that, that they reenact the, the Last Supper? And I got, a, I got a pastor friend that's preaching on this this morning and more power to him. But I'm telling you, I got more important things to do than denounce the world. I'm here to pronounce Jesus. And this is the problem. Listen. 
This is the problem. We spend way too much time telling the world how bad they are instead of telling the world how good Jesus is. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Oh, my God. Okay, hang on. Hang on here. Okay. You, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to tell, to be His witnesses. Not to tell the world how bad they are. Not to tell the world how sinful they are. And not to tell the world how offended you are. Tell them about Jesus. Come on, it's time. It's time. Look, look, this is your mission. Your mission isn't to be outraged by the world. Your, your mission is to declare Jesus to the world. Your, your mission is to represent Jesus to the world. Listen, I'm, so, I, I'm sorry if you posted something. I, did, I just didn't get to you soon enough, okay? I don't know, some of you already boycotted the Olympics, and, and that's fine if you want to do that, but nobody knows that, and who cares? I'm serious. I'm serious. The world doesn't care. The world wants you unengaged. The world wants you disconnected. So you can't be light in darkness. So quit telling the world how bad it is and start telling them about how good Jesus is. Okay? Still love me? I should hope so because I love you. I, I know sometimes you're looking for your pastor to respond to things that are in the news and respond to things that we hear about. And I don't, I don't, I just... That, that's not my calling. My calling is not social commentary. My calling is not, is not to denounce evil. My calling is to pronounce Jesus. Yes, we are God's spokespersons in this day and age. And yes, we need to represent Jesus. That's why we speak truth and minister with grace. But the greatest truth is not how sinful the world is. The greatest truth that the world needs to hear is how good Jesus is. How much he loves those bad people. Okay, um, I really should have done, we should have taken the offering before I preach that part, I know. Because some of you are going, okay, I didn't know this was the kind of church. I just, we're, look. Let's announce the Savior. Because you know what? Jesus never condemned the sinful people that he met. Read your Bible. He never condemned sinful people. He didn't. You know, you know, who, you know, who, you know who got the brunt of his ire? Religious people. His ire, his anger, his frustration was reserved for the religious people who were self-righteous and who didn't feel they needed to change. So instead of only ranting about how wicked the culture has become, that, and I know somebody says, well, that's true. That's the truth. We need to offer Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, the one that God sent to close the distance that sin creates between us and God. That's grace. And that's what the world needs. We don't only want to denounce the evil of this world. Come on, let's announce the Savior. Elijah announced it. This is how he said he said, I'm here in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. He says, the Lord, the God of Israel, lives you know, he actually made that statement before he pronounced judgment. Wouldn't that be good for you and me? Before we jump on, on uh, to denounce the world and its wickedness and its evil, let's pronounce Jesus. Is that, is that fair? It's more than fair. And I think you'll find that you have the ear of people and you'll have an opportunity to plant the seeds of grace and God's love in people's hearts instead of them becoming defensive. Standing strong against the cultural current begins with a commitment to God's call. Okay? Commitment is a conscious, 
I like what, this is uh, one author I read. He, he shared this. He says, commitment is a conscious, irrevocable decision. It means that you know what you're doing, and there'll be no turning back from this act of your will. A commitment. Some people get a religious feeling, and they make a public commitment, but they never show up again. That's not what commitment is. Commitment is not a religious feeling. God's not looking for a flash-in-the-pan promise from anybody in the room. Not from me, not from you. He wants to know how far are you willing to go in your commitment to Jesus Christ. We sang at the beginning, I'll follow you anywhere, wherever you lead. Whatever is going to happen, I will follow you. That was, our, that was our declaration. That was a commitment. I don't know, if, does that song make you uncomfortable? I know it's kind of catchy, it's kind of a nice tune. I know it, can we kind of sing it without thinking about it? But that, that song should make you uncomfortable. Wherever you lead me, right? I mean, whatever happens, I'm, gonna, I'm committed to following you, Jesus. Whew. I mean, I, I mean, we sing that song. It was the first song of the, of the worship set, and Sarah and I talked about this a couple weeks ago when we were preparing this, this for this Sunday. And I got to tell you, I, I, even then, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a great first song. That's a good, for, it gets, kind of gets us going, you know. Kinda. But, man, I'm telling you, I sang, I sang the song a little bit differently knowing what I was preaching on today because it made me uncomfortable. Standing strong against evil begins with a commitment. Standing strong begins with a commitment. Standing strong against evil will involve trusting God's unorthodox methods. He's going to have you do things like be kind to people. He's going to have you do things like, like be kind to those who aren't kind to you. You know, he's going he's to call you to do things that make you uncomfortable. He's going to call you to do things that don't even make sense. He's going to have you call, he's going to call you to say something, and, and, and you're like, I can't say that. And, and you're going to have a little, in, this little dialogue inside with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to say, yeah, you need to say that. And you're going to say, no, I, I can't say that. You're, but we're not even talking about that. But, and the Holy Spirit's going to say, I know, that's why I want you to say it. And you're going to say, no. And, and listen, if you're not careful, you're going to talk yourself out of an opportunity because it's an unorthodox, it's illogical. It doesn't make sense to you. But if the Holy Spirit is moving you to speak or to do something that doesn't make sense, I can promise you he's got a plan for what's on the other side of the, that conversation. He can do something that you cannot do. But oftentimes he wants you involved. So it means that not only do we trust those and obey him, we've got to trust God with the results. We don't worry about the results. I like the way David Wilkerson said it. He says, when God calls you to something, he's not always calling you to succeed. He's calling you to obey. The success of the calling, he wrote, the success of, of the calling is up to him. The obedience is up to you. So we can stand strong because we stand before God, with God. God's calling. What's your response? I don't know about you, but I, I, I know that I need to repent for some half-hearted promises that I've made. I, I've, I've made kind of half-hearted commitments to God before. Anybody with me? Okay. Uh, that's not Elijah. That's not the spirit of Elijah. Okay? It wasn't John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah. Okay? There's nothing half hearted about him. And there needs and, and if we're gonna make this commitment, it needs, we need to be all in. And we need to mean it. These are the days of Elijah. God's calling you. He's calling you. What will your response be? If you're wondering about the status of your relationship with God right now, okay, let me just give you a little way to know. How would you honestly describe it to someone? I mean, honestly, how would you describe your relationship with God right now? If it was just you and me in the room, how would you describe your relationship?
that tells you your answer. Okay. Now, if you're gonna it, if if you're gonna try to you know um, if you're gonna try to put on airs, you're gonna. But I'm talking that I'm talking about if you are honest, gut level honest about your relationship with God, assessing your relationship God, with God. All in or not in at all or somewhere in between. How would you describe your relationship with the Lord? That tells you what. That tells you what you need to do, right? And for some, that means repenting. It means, God, I, I, I've pretended to be all in. I've, I've wanted to be all in, but I've compromised, and I'm not all in. Today, you can make a commitment to God with your whole heart. You can make a commitment to follow Him. And you can ask God, not only, not only repenting, okay, not only saying, God, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry I was wrong. I'm so sorry I've lived like this. I'm so sorry I've, I've not lived all in. I'm, sorry, I'm so sorry I've, held, I've, I've reserved. I'm so sorry I've, I've, I've talked myself out of following you. I've let my fear, I've let my worries, my, my doubts, I've let them keep me from being closer to you. Okay, that's, that's the, maybe the starting place. And let me tell you something, if we, the Bible says if we confess our sins, okay, and let me just adjust that just a little bit, if we confess our, res, our resistance to God, if we confess our resistance to His will and His plan for our lives, He's faithful and just to forgive. Amen? So maybe that's where you need to start today, but that's not where you need to end. Ask God to stand with you so that you can stand strong against the corrupt current of this world. Ask God to stand with you. I like the way the Old Testament prophet said it. Okay? Isaiah. When God, when God said, I'm looking for someone. I'm looking for someone to declare my word. I'm looking for someone. I love, I love Isaiah's response. Here am I. Send me. Come on. What's your response today?